particular uh, event. Well, you know, keep in mind that the women who work then come home after work to their second job. Oh. So, um... Don't I know it? My mom taught school, then she'd be shopping on, on the way home and then cooking dinner for my dad so that there would be dinner on the table when he got home at 6 from 55th right. Street and, and 7th and Avenue. And, you know, <laughs> making sure the kids' homework is done, getting the kids to brush their teeth and get to bed, you know, doing laundry... And then you plop into bed completely exhausted and fried, and you're supposed to also want to have sex. So um, <sighs> women are being pulled in a lot of different directions. It's a cruel joke. It's, it's a it's, cruel joke is what it sounds like. It really is. Medicines have been put in place to enable the unhealthy behavior. And that's what our culture is developing. Right. And we're drugging the, the 25% of the women on these psychiatric drugs alone, and we don't even know the rest of the things. They're t you're not even including. When you're saying one in four women is on a psychiatric med, not we're not adding into that the women who are taking alcohol and who are taking coke and heroin and right. various other things, right? I'm not even including sleeping pills in that 25%. And I will tell you that there are some demographics. For instance, the demographic where I work, the women in New York City and Manhattan, those numbers are much higher. What's the sleeping pill of choice? Uh, Ambien? What are they taking? Ambien is still very, very popular. Um, there's another medicine called Lunesta that went generic Lunesta. not too long ago that, that's got a little bit of a market share. But Ambien has the bulk of the market share when it comes to sleeping pills. Let's talk about um, the sleep that women are missing because that's one of the, right on your, on your title of your book, right on the cover, it says the sleep you're missing. What about the sleep that women are missing? You know, one of the reasons we added that to the subtitle is yeah. because it turns out that that is a very, very popular Google search for women, is looking for insomnia cures. That's right. Um, most women are sleeping six or seven hours a night, whereas the research is saying now you need between eight and nine. So none of us are sleeping enough. And one of the big problems that happens with perimenopausal hormone changes is that insomnia becomes a very big issue. Um, and uh, anxious mothers, pregnant uh, you know, newborns. There's lots of there's lots of uh, reasons for for sleep disorders in women that men don't have. And in general, you know, when I talk to men, um, they can sleep sitting up. They can sleep in a train. Or <laughs> uh, a lot of women I talk to need to be lying down. They need to make sure that their that their children are already asleep. You know, they have a lot of prerequisites before they can sort of power down. And men don't really have those same prerequisites. So uh, a woman a woman's sleep is is uh, Often, you know, one of the things that is most disordered when she'll come to my office. By and the I way, I wanted to explain that when I laughed there, it wasn't about the fact that women uh, need all those aids to sleep. It's when you said men sleep more easily, because I learned to sleep standing up as a young man in, in Manhattan uh, on the subway to catch right. a quick nap in between, and I could. I found I could fall asleep standing. Power down. I mean, men can definitely power down much more easily than women can. And it's a big problem because we... Even if we've done all the chores and the kids are down and everything and, you know, husband's had sex and so he's off snoring and then the women are awake and they're thinking about what they have to do tomorrow, what they did wrong today. You know, they're just going through these sort of mental acrobatics um, and they can't turn it off. So a lot, a lot of women are taking Ambien sleeping pills. In, addi I, in addition I, to the one in four who are taking the psychiatric medications that you're right. talking about. right. That, that one in four does not include sleeping pills. What percentage, um, just roughly, what percentage of the women that you treat are overweight or obese? I have to say that because I'm in New York City, I don't have a lot of obese patients. I mean, I, I've, I've got a few, but I'm sure that if I were practicing in the middle of the country, it would be a much higher percentage. The thing about New York City is that people walk. Um, so they don't tend to be morbidly obese as much as people who are in a complete car culture where they're constantly uh, just going from the couch to the to the car. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm referring to, the statistics I gave before, they're very concerning about the uh, about these increasing levels of obesity and well, I overweight. Was just, I was just in Amsterdam talking to a lot of Dutch women, um, and they were all saying that when they came to America, the thing that freaked them out the most was how fat everybody was and how sedentary everyone was. Um, I think that our, what we're eating is a huge problem in terms of inflammation. And I think, you know, the processed foods are inflammatory. And being sedentary is inflammatory. And so it ends up sort of cycling on itself. You know, inflammation causes obesity, but then fat creates inflammation. 
so it, it gets sort of exponential. As soon as it, as soon as you start getting a little overweight, it can really be a you know sort of a, a runaway train where it's it's cycling on itself because the obesity and inflammation feed each other. Um, and then when you know you get into these pre-diabetic situations, um, I have to say that I don't have a ton of overweight patients. I'm I'm happy to say, but one of the reasons why I don't have a ton of overweight patients, Richard, is that I am a nudge. My patients stay with me for years and years, and I, every single time I talk to them, I bug them about cardio. I bug them about exercise, about moving their bodies every day, staying in your body, staying physically active. So I don't have a lot of overweight patients because they, you know. They listen a bit. They'll either do what I say or they'll leave me because <laughs> I will not let up on this. Uh, yeah. Cardio cardio is king, and if you want to feel better, you've got to move your body. I'm, and then I talk quite a bit about anti-inflammatory diets and, and really cutting back on flour and sugar and processed foods, the white powders, yes. um, and and the additives and preservatives. Um, they're making us sick, and they're making us feel miserable, and they're making us fat. So, you know, a lot of doctors don't... I remember I, I started talking to my patients more about diet, I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago or something, and one of them said... You're the first doctor who ever asked me anything about what I eat. Mm-hmm. I've heard that over and over now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if I ask somebody what they eat for breakfast, they start telling me, like, you know, no doctor asks you what I eat for breakfast. And, like, they should because, it's you know, it's fuel for the machine. And mm-hmm. how you feel, I mean, it's so obvious and basic. But when I was in med school, we did not learn about nutrition at all. We had no discussions about food or what to eat or what was healthy. We learned about vitamins in terms of the chemical equations that, that there are cofactors in. But nothing about nutrition at all, and I'm I'm hoping that that's changing. I'm right? sure hoping that's changing. I mean, I took one lecture on the on, on the uh, pancreas, and that was the end of me eating carbohydrates for breakfast for the rest of my life. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I just one patient. I just told him to cut out orange juice in the morning, and it made a huge difference. But, like, it doesn't take much. By the way, for those of you listening, the, the reason Julie is saying this and the reason I said that about the pancreas and cutting out the carbs is because the carbs will give you a nice spike. You'll give you some fast energy, but you know just for, with all the various uh, things that give us a spike, there's then going to be a drop. So then an hour and two hours after that, you're going to be down about, what, 9 or 10 o'clock or 10.30. Whereas if you have protein in the morning, you're going to get a more even burn across the board, and you won't have the dip. And that's why she and I are saying that. And that's an important important for people to know the difference between that. And, and I write, it's amazing that it's not being... Uh, still not being taught in medical schools. We hope that's that's switching. Talk about switching. I want to switch over now, and have you talk, please, a bit about two of the most two of the most popular psychiatric medicines. Uh, first, it's going to be Zoloft. And it, uh, before we talk, I want to say something about Zoloft. It, are you familiar with the Duke study where they compared um, Zoloft to exercise? If not, I'll give a, a brief summary of it. Yeah, I am, but you should go ahead for your listeners. Okay, there, they, they, there were three groups in this study. One group got Zoloft, one group got exercise, and one group got Zoloft and exercise. Remember, Zoloft is an SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. What that means is that the little receivers inside the junction box that pull in the Zoloft and distribute it, they get blocked by this medicine so that the, 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 uh, the uh, serotonin builds up. And it, so it's a blocker. And so one group got the Zoloft, one group got exercise, one group gets both. Pre-testing, post-testing for depression, the people on the Zoloft did the best. The people... I mean, excuse me, the people on the exercise did the best. I beg your pardon. The people on the exercise did the best. The people on the Zoloft did the worst until they looked at Zoloft and exercise. And guess what? The people on Zoloft and exercise did even worse. And what they theorized there was that the Zoloft actually counters the effect of the exercise. And there was a, by the way, they did a follow-up on that three or four years after that and found the same thing. And yet... We continue to give Zoloft, I, I guess in part, Julie, it's because it's easy, you can't get some people to exercise, so if it's either nothing or something, is that, I mean, what's the rationale for continuing in the face of this kind of evidence? Well, I, you know, I always joke in my office, if I could just write a prescription for exercise and you would actually think it <laughs> that's what 
I would do. And I and I have actually written down on a piece of prescription paper, you know, like specific cardio, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, 40 minutes, you know, just to make it sort of more official because it's, it's so easy to go home and fill the prescriptions and take the pills every day. And it's much harder to, you know, go outside for a walk or a run or get to the gym. I mean, I understand that it's challenging and that's why I spend time talking about it with my and enabling them, figuring out how to make it work for them. I mean, everybody's got, you know, long hours at work, and when can they go, and, and we sort of construct a plan. Um, if I were living in Manhattan, I think one thing I would do is I would park further away than where I'm going if I ever drive and force myself to walk from where the car's parked to where I'm going just to get some blocks in. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell patients to, you know, get off the subway a couple times. Oh, oh, terrific. So just if they can walk. But I also, I, um, you know, I really like my patients doing things like yoga um, or I, I like I like Bikram yoga. I went through a long phase of really enjoying running. I think it's important just to find something that you like that you don't resent. If you mm-hmm. hate going to the gym, then don't go to the gym. Just go outside for a walk. Put on some music on your headphones and just walk around. You know, it doesn't have to be this the, something that you resent and that you are, you know, trying to get out of. I mean, optimally, it's something you actually enjoy that makes you feel good and makes your body feel good. And, you know, I talk in, in Moody Bitches quite a bit about the cannabinoid system and, and how cannabis is an anti-inflammatory medicine. Um, I also talk about how the endocannabinoid system floods your brain with cannabinoids when you're doing moderate exercise. You know, everyone talks about the runner's high as being an opiate-based, that it's endorphins. But there's a lot more research to suggest that it's actually cannabinoid-based. Um, so, you know, my point is exercise makes you feel good, and it has not only anti-inflammatory property, but it also helps to grow brain cells. And granted, antidepressants can help to grow, grow brain cells, but you're better off doing it with exercise. And this, this idea that combining antidepressant and exercise will make you feel even worse than antidepressants alone um, is, like, it's hard for me to swallow. It's hard for me to accept because... Um, but it just, you know, it makes me more committed to, to using exercise as a way to help my patients get off their medicine, which is what I do. Um, when I have people finally get off their medicines, there's a few things that reliably make it easier for patients to get off their medicines. And one thing is cardio. If, I, if somebody turns into a runner, it's much easier for them to taper their meds. Let's, um, I, I want to underline that. That's very important. Did you hear that, folks? If, you, if you're a runner or, let's say, an exerciser, Dr. Holland is saying it's easier to get off the psychiatric medications. Thank you for letting me uh, un- underline that. Sounds very important. Um, and, and I forgot the other thing. That I okay. Was... Well, I want to come back. Abilify is an antipsychotic. Zoloft isn't, but Abilify is. And yet Abilify is, is a major seller in this country. Talk a little to us a little bit about Zoloft and Abilify, please. Okay, well, first of all, Abilify is a really good medicine, and it was originally designed to treat schizophrenia, and if you have schizophrenia, it is one of the best antipsychotics you can take. I think it does really amazing things for schizophrenia, and I certainly saw it work wonders at Bellevue, and in my private practice, the few times that I did work with schizophrenics. Um, but schizophrenics are only 1% of the world population. If you can target half the world's population, you're going to make a little bit more money. So Abilify started targeting women with depression, women who are on meds who weren't getting really good response from their meds and and recommending that Abilify be used as an add-on to treat depression. And they got an FDA indication to be used as an add-on, and that's really when the money started rolling in for them. Um, Now, Zoloft is the most popularly prescribed antidepressant among non-psychiatrists, and I think that's important to remember. The way Zoloft really got its foothold is that um, Pfizer um, would send the drug reps out to to the family practice docs and the internists and the GPs, and they would have samples for you know antihypertensives like medicine for blood pressure things like that. But there, but the drug reps for Pfizer would also give samples of Zoloft and and tell these doctors who weren't psychiatrists if your patient's complaining that they're anxious or depressed or have trouble sleeping, this is a medicine you can use. So it really got its foothold because it, it was prescribed by non-psychiatrists. But um, the SSRI that I prescribe that I actually like is, is Lexapro, and that is the, the one that I believe is more commonly prescribed by psychiatrists than Zoloft. But Zoloft is often very high in the mix. And at one point, I think it was 2010, Zoloft, Zoloft sold more units than Tide, the, anti, the, the detergent. Um, so it's very commonly prescribed and commonly taken. I'm not crazy about Zoloft because I believe a couple of things. First of all, I think it has a lot of GI side effects. 
um, you know, it it can make people nauseous. It can cause diarrhea, this sort of thing. But hold um, it aside. But when she said GI, folks, that's a gastrointestinal. Just for everybody. <laughs> big, my big complaint with yeah. Zoloft is that it can really make your entire pelvis numb, make oh. it much less sexually responsive, and make it much more difficult to climax. Wow. Uh, Julia, 